All right, welcome back uh, to 2024's first episode of Business of Motorsports. I am excited to be here today with a really special guest, Brian Carter, who is the CEO of World Racing Group. Um, and it is going to be just really cool to talk to somebody who's at the helm of another series. Um, uh, obviously, with, with my background in NASCAR and then now us owning the Cars Tour, I've got lots of curious questions. Um, I know there's going to be a lot of commonality. So we're going to dive into those intricacies of, of that and just learn about Brian's story, learn about uh, the World of Outlaws um, racing and uh, dirt car series racing. Um, I didn't know all these things, so I just, I'm so curious. So i um, excited to dive into this. And um, this segment today is brought to you by Ally, and I'm so excited to be back in the Bojangles studio. All right, Brian. So uh, welcome to the Business of Motorsports. I'm super excited. You're my first guest. And I'm so glad that when I reached out to uh, Tish, who I've known for a long time, that you said yes. Yeah, I'm excited to be here. It's uh, 2024 already. I can't believe it. It's uh, trucking along and we're going to be back in Volusia near Daytona again going racing. So it's exciting. I know. It comes quick and it passes quick, doesn't it? <laughs> there, the pace today is uh, unbelievable. It's so much faster and things happen. The expectations are high. It's uh, nonstop, 24 hours a day and as fast a pace as I've ever seen it. Yep. So so I want to start. Um, I've, I've got so many things I want to dive into because uh, uh, you guys have done a lot of things really cool um, with the streaming service and um, just a lot of different things. So I want to dive into that. But first, you know, talk about your position. Talk about how you joined uh, World Racing Group. Um, don't forget to talk about your background in financial and Chuck E. Cheese. I got to hear about Chuck E. Cheese. <laughs> oh, my God. That's funny. That uh, Yeah, my first client at Deloitte when I started back in 1989, I guess, 1990, it was uh, Chuck E. Cheese, Showbiz Pizza, the merger of that company and entertainment right off the bat in my career. So, uh, yeah, it's been an interesting journey. I, I, people ask me, how did you get here? It's really kind of happenstance. You know, I grew up as a race fan, started going to the track. My mom would tell you before I was born back in Manassas Speedway in Virginia, uh, my dad was a huge race fan. So I, I started out as a fan first, started going to Heart of Texas Speedway um, in 1974. So it was a long time ago. Just grew up as a race fan and uh, just happenstance put me back in it in a way in which I could contribute from a from my career and, and, and integrated into what I was doing. So it's been an interesting journey from a Texas boy growing up in Mejia, Texas, uh, and then ending up so close to where the home of the World of Outlaws was, seeing it as I was growing up. 1978 puts me a long time ago, but <laughs> I missed the first race. I didn't get to see the first race, but it was a part. I, I knew what was happening. It was fun to fun to see it, and uh, just growing up a dirt racing fan my entire life. And and then happenstance would have me back in a place where I can contribute in a way that I'd never really expected to be able to. And and now 20 years later from the time in 2003, it's just extraordinary to see it and to be be a part of it. So I don't know how much of that history you want to see, but yeah, showbiz. I started it as a Deloitte finance guy, so it's 10 years at Deloitte pretty much raising money for my clients, helping them uh, from a CPA and from a consulting perspective and raised a lot of money along the way, almost seven and a half billion dollars. So it was, it was fun to be able to do some things and, and really leverage that relationship, uh, the background and, and the finance side and kind of bring some of those resources to dirt racing. A lot of this stuff had started to happen before I got involved. Actually, one of the investors initially in what became what is World Racing Group was an investor in a software company I was taking public in back in the late 90s in Dallas. And it just happened that, hey, we're starting this motorsports company. We had some some aligned investors. They, they were investing in the software company and they were starting to invest in what was to become a boundless racing and, and, and dirt motorsports. So when I started, uh, when I could see the software company and bringing it to a close as we sold it, the investors say, hey, what do, we're working on this motorsport property. What do you think? And I'm like, hell yeah, I'm in. <laughs> it, was, it was like, yeah, I, I'm in. It's like, what, let's let's talk about what you're trying to do. And then it was a mess. It was a real mess. They were buying the World of Outlaws. They were buying UMP. They were building a, a MotoGP track of, on top of a nuclear or a, a – um, a, uh, uh, a uh, oh my gosh, what it was it called in Waxahachie? It was the old uh, 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 GPX racetrack. It was uh, that was a long time ago. I blocked that one. There must be some reason I blocked that from my trauma. memory. That's right. There's some trauma there. Yeah. I guess I have, to, I have to talk to my therapist about that one. Um, but yeah, it's been an interesting journey to see how the world wants its motorsports and how it wants its dirt racing and how it wants and how it all fits and and some of the things that are 
it's been an interesting ride. It was we were a public company. I take pride in being beating NASCAR and SMI to go in private. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I thought about that. Yeah. yeah so so I, I'm curious about that. Um, why take motorsports public at that point? Well, it was an easy way to raise capital. Yeah. Uh, so you know, the the marketplace was enamored with it, and it was a, a highlight time, and uh, it created awareness too. So one of the you know the pursuits we're after is awareness, and and the being public, and the excitement, and energy, and telling the story, and, and you could really merge that. So we we tried that. It was a public company before I got involved, which is one of the reasons why I got involved because it was a mess, and it wasn't in compliance, and it was doing all sorts of things, and but we were still following the tide. We really were the, the, the awareness and all the things that were happening in the, in the early 2000s and all the, the good pieces around motorsports. We were able to take advantage of that and raise money in the public market. And, uh, and then when all that stopped which for everybody in 2008, uh, we really had to reevaluate how much visibility we wanted to give the world to what we were doing and what we're trying to get done. Because it is a, it is a place they power is based on how much you know, who you know, how you get it done. And, and the public environment was really tough. And I think SMI and NASCAR figured out pretty quick, too, that the public environment's tough, especially in motorsports. And everybody who knows something is, thinks they know something. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. But we beat them going private, too. So now we're in a private world and we can operate in a way that's very nimble for us. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, that, I worked for Action Performance at the time when they were going private, too. And like you said, it was in the same timing that you're talking about when NASCAR was just blowing up and the demands to meet, you know, what they were looking for at Wall Street were tough. And they were tough in this business, particularly because you're dealing with, um, you know, our timelines in the in, in the motorsports business don't follow your typical business when you can plan out and you know with sponsors changing and things changing and drivers changing and all these things changing uh, it's really hard to plan around a lot of those things so right and then the disclosure started to become and then the processes and when you think about trying to evolve at a dirt track or even a even a nascar track when you've got all of the all of the cash and the transactions and the different yeah. pieces and, and then you try to make that compliance like yep, yeah this is going to be a lot tougher than people imagine so we started going through that process and and actually got all that done and at the time we're able to, you know, we raised a lot of money in private equity and we're able to navigate that exit in a way that really didn't disrupt and really people didn't understand or didn't really even know what was happening. So from my perspective, now being a privately held company with just uh, myself and the original investment banker being the two partners, we can be- Still the same partners. Still the same partners after all since this time. after all this time. So it's uh, it's been a great ride and now we can navigate this in a way in which we can behave much like a- a small company yeah, can, and it's yeah. it's actually gives us a lot of flexibility. So let's talk about um, how you guys operate. Um, I, you know, I'll be honest. Um, you talked about brand awareness and growing up and growing up in motorsports. You know, certainly the world of outlaws is a, a name that I know. I won't say a lot about, but you know, it's it's what I know, right? It's at the forefront. I did not realize that you guys were also um, the promoter and sanction body for like UMP and other dirt car stuff, the Super Dirt series, Super Dirt Car series, and things like that. So, um, talk about just uh, you know how broad the business is, and then I also want to to dive into kind of your promoting and sanctioning at the same time, and not one or the other. Right. Um, no, it's a it's been a it's been an interesting journey. We we own UMP, we own, uh, which is Dirt Car, and mm -hmm. we have Super Dirt Car Series. We have 15 touring series. People don't understand mm -hmm. all of that. We sanction uh, weekly, tra weekly tracks, uh, a couple hundred weekly tracks across the country, uh, and provide some stability and normalcy for them. So really, it's been this amazing awareness campaign. People are aware of the world of outlaws, but they don't understand what it takes to make the world of outlaws successful is this ecosystem of dirt racing that has to survive on a weekly basis and thrive at the same, you know, so that we can only be as good as the tracks and the and the racing community is. Uh, I think that's the same the thing that we think through in NASCAR with grassroots racing, right? Yep. When, why we're so passionate, particularly myself and Dale and Junior Motorsports are so passionate about late model stock racing and grassroots racing because it is what feeds the yeah. bigger ecosystem, it is not like only, you said. Not only the drivers, but but the fans yes. and, and, and the manufacturers and all the other pieces that the balancing act that you're trying to create. And, you know, if you keep that foundation strong, you can build something really cool on top. And and that's what we're, what we're doing with uh, all of our it's been the that that's been the focus since the very beginning is creating a, a hierarchy, a balance of how does this work when we leave? 
you know, we can't just have one huge weekend with the outlaws in town and then expect the ecosystem to survive the rest of the year. So we really pr- trying to provide an awareness and stability for the industry throughout. And then leverage, you mentioned promoting, but leverage all of those relationships then to not only schedule events, but schedule all the events in. And then you're managing the UMP and the Summer Nationals, the dirt car pieces, and you're managing the Super Dirt Car Series. You know, Ted Johnson back in the day didn't really care what Glenn Donnelly was doing in the Northeast, but now you have all these tracks that we're trying to figure out a balancing act and, and getting us moving across the country now 12 months through the year uh, with 15 different touring series. It, 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 it allows us to create an offering for the racetracks that helps them survive and, and thrive throughout the year. Uh, so that we can have a big event when we we need the 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 place at full tilt with the world of outlaws there. So I'm gonna guess um, just based off of what you said, tracks like Williams Grove and Port Royal are those tracks that are within your peripheral that you help. And what does it actually look like when you say that you know to keep that eco- ecosystem strong at that level? Well, it's uh, uh, Williams Grove is a great example of what we're trying to do. You know, people people wonder well, how do we support weekly 410 racing? Well, what we've done is we've, we're have we trying to create an awareness campaign. You know, if you look at where we've been able to do it, it's actually through our streaming platform, mm-hmm. through our support of Williams Grove and Attica and, and Knoxville and Beaver Dam and, and Hussets and uh, our weekly Dervision tracks are really trying to create awareness and uh, the cornerstones of the sprint car racing community so that we can support them on a weekly basis, create awareness that creates an overall fan base so that when our events start to elevate as we come in with the World of Outlaws. So there's whether it's two or three X come in for that special World of Outlaws show. We need that X at the bottom to be the the important part that 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 baseline customer base for the tracks has to be strong or you end up in a place where there's not going to be a fan base to come in Mm -hmm. when we come in for the week so but the supporting part of you know if you talk about ump and the dirt car piece the illinois and the indiana the uh, you know we start to support those programs with the weekly tracks and then you end up you it's it's really this sort of whole machine that's moving um and creating again a, a foundation to build on and then to it's it's a it's a it's a complicated business and it's really driven by the whole balance of of you know you need fans first you have to have fans or we're not going we don't be racing in front of anybody then nobody's going to want to sponsor anybody and nobody's going to be watching it so it really is a fan first business then you build out how do, how do you create as many livings around it yeah. <laughs> that's what we're yeah. trying to do yeah and really you know i mean to me it's like all the stakeholders right you've got you've just got to you're working with every stakeholder for the bigger picture that's right that's right, right. i and think that's a struggle that we always talk about in nascar we're we're getting there <laughs> and 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 but but it hasn't always been that way you right. know so so in the the important. model that we bought from ted you know he he from 1978 to 2003 he was fundamentally building a business based on sanction fees and t-shirt sales so let's not be and then yeah. he had sponsors and tv and all the other pieces that really kind of got in front of him he kind of got it growing so fast and then it kind of ran him over a little bit uh, trying to get to where it it wanted to be, but he wasn't really ready to get there. But, you know, as we started looking at the business, as you invest in brand awareness and you invest in the marketing side and your only upside is the same sanction fee that we're actually getting less in the sanction fee than we were when we bought it. So the $25,000 a night for a sanction fee for the World of Outlaws hasn't changed in 20 years. But the evolution of what the what we needed to build the community, which is the whole, the racing community is, okay, well, we really need to get create the direct relationship with the customer so that's how we became promoters so we bought racetracks in the in the process but we also became promoters of the world of outlaws and promoters of events and and by doing that we can mitigate risk across a lot more you know if you have a bad weekend it's not catastrophic to some promoters if you have a bad weekend it can be mm. really painful and and something some promoters may not be able to recover from so for us if we're going to invest in the brand awareness, invest in the growth of the sport, we only have so many weekends, we can make $25,000. We really had to come to a different conclusion as to where the sport needed to evolve to, which is the evolution of the whole community, the promotion, the series, bringing all that in. And as you create that community, you create more, um, you know, more opportunities, more opportunities, more opportunities. opportunities. So, you know, in order for us to, to justify the brand 
marketing and the other pieces, we really needed to take on some more of the upside and then more of the risk along the way with selling tickets and promoting shows. And and that's really where the business started to take off. Yeah, we've had a lot of conversation um, as it relates to the Cars Tour. So with uh, the four owners that purchased the Cars Tour, my brother being one of them and managing, I've been helping manage that transition. And so many, so much of what you're saying you know, we've we've tossed and we're only in our second year and so we're not ready to take over everything. But it but it is, you know, you're working with tracks and you're talking about the sanctioning fees and what they how the track needs to make it work for what works for them all year long, just like you said, versus how we need it to work and work for our competitors and work for our event that's there. They bring in other, you know, series and whatnot, then that if weather comes that leans in to our streaming and whether we can go on time or not you know there's just so many things there that um that i can understand how that would um make it simpler but you do take on a lot more risk but ultimately more reward right that's right and it allows (laughs) you to do things that you didn't think you could do if you're selling tickets and you create a ticket database you're creating a one destination for your fans you're creating that again you're just strengthening the community and trying to do it you know historically the ticket buyers at williams grove wouldn't communicate with the ticket buyers from eldora and 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 that's what they want now they want a one place to go to shop and then we can guide them there that's our websites are really the you know, the gate to get to how how do people to interact and again. the websites i'm generalizing the social media channels the different ways in which we communicate with our race fans but pulling that community together and communicating with them in a way that you're communicating you know we're selling tickets at tracks in texas we've never been to before well our ticket database is at at uh, devil's bowl and cotton bowl will help us sell tickets into big o or into kennedale so creating that sort of that connectivity with the race mm-hmm. fans has to happen more than just how are we reporting race results and, and reporting our schedule. It's just, yeah. it's evolving at a pace, but that creation of that promoting arm, the selling tickets, that community has allowed us to be pretty flexible in how we approach things, either with the new promoters or with a new track or with a new series, different things and how to, it's, it's, uh, it's moving pretty fast, but that's what the, the, the sport evolves quickly. I mean, these cars, you can see it here on the table. The cars evolve. We, yeah. we need to evolve as a business, too. So um, as you're making the schedules and, and looking, how far in advance do you work? Because, we're like you said, we're starting the year. You're about to come up to your uh, second event here at Volusia. And, um, you know, are you already working on 25? Like, I'm sure you are. I run a business. <laughs> But, you know, how far out in advance and changing tracks and making those decisions and what things look like before you've maybe even, you know, gotten through part of your year here? Yeah, we're looking. I mean, we've already announced our 25 speed. We are our, 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 our uh, dirt car nationals and how that fits. And the world is evolving with with some racetracks closing at East Bay mm-hmm. and and Daytona moving their schedules around, continuing. You know, so it's it's. You'd love to be able to say this is our date, but there's so many dynamics into what goes into the schedule. And not only us, but now we're managing other dirt series. We're managing, we're trying to manage around the NASCAR fans because they have an effect on how we do things. And so it's a, it's a constantly evolving. We're trying to get out as far as we can. The good thing now is we're looking as far down the field as we ever have. You know, we're not waiting until I remember in the early days going to the, the promoters meetings in Reno, everybody's negotiating their calendar. And this is in December. I'm like, you know, we, if we don't have something, uh, preliminary by July for next year, yeah. we are in trouble. Yeah. So it's, a, it is, we're looking into next year. We're getting commitments from tracks, uh, that they want dates and how, how, what, what date they want. And then we work that in and then it's probably finalized. You know, the goal is always August, September, and it comes out in October, November, but it's, it's a, it's a, such a amazingly dynamic process. Um, it's earlier and earlier and earlier Yeah, because you have to stake your claim. <laughs> so you mentioned, you know, kind of thinking about the NASCAR fan. Um, is that relatively new for you in the last several years of having to really, you know, think about where the NASCAR fan fits into dirt racing? Because I feel like, uh, Kyle Larson and some of those drivers have certainly opened up the eyeballs to dirt racing mm-hmm. and how much fun it is. My son races micros and I mean, it's the most fun next to next to asphalt modifieds. Dirt racing is the most fun that I feel like we can have. We talk about, um, obviously I run an asphalt team, but man, we just love the dirt racing. It's so fun. Um, do you, is that something new for you to think about that fan or have it, has it always kind of existed? It, it, was, it, it existed before I, but when, when Bruton and the guys decided to buy uh, and Humpy decided mm, to build dirt tracks the speedways, right, at the yeah. speedway. So that, that, that was, that was set in place long before me. So, yeah. uh, our, our job is to continue to evolve that. And, and what's happening is, is the, 
as our our fans' attention spans continue to shorten, <laughs> the dirt track <laughs> racing tends to appeal to more. Mm-hmm. But the hard time, the hard thing now is, are the NASCAR fans coming for four days or five day weekends? Can you build events around that, or do you have to avoid it completely? And that's that's the hard balance because when we built our two weeks at Dirt Car Nationals, it was dependent upon the Daytona running the the two weekends at. In Daytona, yeah. Now it's not the case. We can support. We support ourselves without Daytona right, fans. Right, right. So, yeah. so it's a constant evolution. So, and Daytona didn't run that last weekend at night at all. You ran against the Thursday night uh, duels, duels, maybe. Right. But beyond that, now they're racing Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night. We're trying to race late models at Volusia. So, it's a mainly trying to make sure we mix in. We understand what we're dealing with, and but then going to Texas and going to Atlanta and and Talladega, those those things do have an effect, and the fans only. Have have so much money and resources and time to go to races so it is definitely part of what we're managing but uh, we're not near as reliant upon going to a nascar track on a nascar weekend to create our crowds yeah. uh, and but back to your question about the awareness camp you know the the crossover of competitors and drivers and and that has always been there i think that the ability our ability to to create awareness around showcase what they're it, doing right. and showcase mm-hmm. it has definitely helped yeah. both 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 fan bases. I, yeah. I hope, and that's yeah. that's our goal is to create awareness about motorsports. And if we do that, we'll bring them in. And once you get in, you kind of get that addiction. You can't get us. You can't get the cure. You just got to yeah. keep coming. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there is no cure for sure. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So let's talk about streaming. Um, uh, and I purposely didn't look this up so that I could uh, maintain my curiosity. But uh, when you know, talk about the idea of streaming. On Owning it yourself, you, just the whole why and how, um, because to me that sounds super um, complicated and super expensive. You it, know, to do it is definitely both. <laughs> it is definitely both. You know, Dirt Vision has been around. We bought the Dirt Vision brand in 2004 when we bought it from uh, Dirt Motorsports from Glenn Donnelly. It was a TV production company that was used to support This Week on Dirt and some of the other mm-hmm. pieces uh, in the Syracuse area, mainly syndicated TV. So, you know, our struggle with TV at dirt racing is, has always been difficult because it's not really, the environment's not conducive to live TV. So when the heyday, when live TV was happening with Ted and with uh, Glenn and the guy is, we were trying to adapt our sport and our entertainment to live TV. And that's a, that's a tall task because we, we have all the dynamics even different than, you know, with the track prep and the, the short spurt racing and the different, the different pieces, it's a difficult task. So what, we knew that we wanted to, and actually dabbled with full live streaming in early to mid 2000s, 2007 and eight, but the technology wasn't there for us. You know, the internet connectivity that it required, the mm-hmm. different pieces just wasn't there. So we actually uh, used it only as our own TV production department. But what streaming has allowed us to do is not, we're not adapting live TV, or our sport to live TV. It allows us to adapt live TV to our sport. So it allows us to, to really uh, portray what's happening at the racetrack on our pace and then create an entertainment value for, for our fans that cannot come to the races. So uh, we've been, we tried, uh, you know, from dirt vision, from all races on dirt vision only happened in 2017. So this is a real, nor, nor, you know, really short period of time here. And then that was only with the world of outlaw sprint cars. Now we're Mm -hmm. talking about 70 races this year. We're going to broadcast over seven or over 600 live dirt racing uh, events on Dirt Vision this year. So to come from 70 uh, to 700 in a matter of a very short period of time is is uh, is definitely an advancement of the technology, the staffing, but it's a lot more complicated and expensive than people uh, <laughs> imagine. But it's been a... It's been an amazing awareness campaign is what it really boils down to. Yeah. Uh, You can watch dirt racing just about any night of the week and you can watch it on our, our platform or other platforms. And, and it really has raised awareness, which is all we're after anyway. Yeah. I read a story. I think it was David Gravel who maybe had gotten a sponsorship based off the fact that you guys were able to have the word of outlaws on TV. Is that, am I, am I remembering that correctly? Yeah. And that was kind of a check, 
check mark for you guys because I think about it from the standpoint of of my kid racing at Millbridge, which is on Dirt Vision, yeah. um, and I'm so thankful. Um, and just all the different places we race, um, sponsors for one. You know, you're, you, it costs money to do this, and I'm talking about a 12 year old kid trying to get sponsors. And the other thing that you mentioned that I I just see um, you know clear as a bell is how you do adapt it for the television and the streaming because people will ask me well I want to watch Wyatt on a Friday night and I'm like we're not going to race our feature till midnight so how long do you want to stay up you know um we start racing at six or seven you've got you know six divisions and all these heat races and beam and you can't by that point it's hard for me to even explain the format you know and they're like midnight how does a 12 year old run at midnight and I'm like yes that's a great question (laughs) I know you guys you know have your programs and and they're more condensed because you don't have all those divisions to deal with but um it's it's uh it's it's the dirt vision aspect of it, I know for Millbridge has been huge. Um, yep. And I can't imagine for all the other tracks and, and just the visibility that gives the competitors and your series um, and then for the fans. You yeah, know, no, as well. it, it's it's being able to craft the story, create and, and the stories from Millbridge. That's the beginning of a lot of racing careers. So our our job is to nurture that through the ecosystem, through through Millbridge is a strategic addition. Not that it's just, we yeah. all love those little cars and I've <laughs> been in midgets before and I love, I love that and, and they're a great family and all those things that make Millbridge so special. But we're really documenting, when you think about it, we're documenting the racing careers of these children that we are going to watch race at, at, a, at a, a worldwide <laughs> level somewhere. They're going to be yep. stars. And we're, we're supporting that infrastructure and ecosystem and creating that awareness at Millbridge. And now we're doing it through the extreme midgets. And then we're looking at other properties on the stock car side, on the dirt car side, it's really easy for us to see. We've got all all of the divisions to do that. On the open wheel side, we're working on filling in those gaps. And Millbridge was a strategic part of that. And, you know, creating that awareness, we have... uh, multiple handfuls of different ex- examples where Dennis and Teresa Roth are racing full time with us because they can watch their car on dirt vision. They can watch their car. They can't, they're at the age where they can't travel. Mm-hmm. It's not, and, and, but they still enjoy it. They and still support. They the don't sport. have a cure, right? They don't, they don't have a cure. <laughs> and they so, still want to be on the track, but they can't go. So they can watch and they can be engaged. And yes, they, as, a, as a, as a, as a, as a fan base that's engaged, that's all people want to be part yeah. of is that community. So De- gravel, we have lots of customers and lots of sponsors that are there because they can watch their car on Dirt Vision. They can watch their car on streaming. And then if they can't watch it that night, they can watch it the next morning when they're having coffee. They can see the highlight. It's, we really are capturing so much more of the true raw uh, part of our sport and portraying that in a way that I think that's, uh, you know, we're creating great entertainment value and engagement with the race fans. And that's all you can do. Yeah. So. Yeah. I think probably um, I have this question. I don't, I don't uh, and, and you can just, you know, divulge what you want to divulge. But um, in terms of streaming, you know, we, our competitors in your series, the Cars Tour series, micro racing, whatever it is, this grassroots kind of racing, you know, outside of NASCAR, we, we're kind of fooled by what we hear in the NASCAR world as far as it relates to TV contracts and rights fees and all this kind of stuff that which um, I know the Cars Tour is not, you know, doesn't, uh, we're not privy to, to all that greatness. But, you know, competitors and fans see the streaming and see want to participate in it, right? But I think, you um, you know, I think it would have to be true that it's just really a blessing that we have it, you know, and and there's money to be made um, at some point where it, where it makes sense. But, you know, the, the newness of streaming um, and the ability to provide these races is very expensive to do. And I just don't think we're there. I'm curious, you know, how, how your competitors and your tracks and all, view that and and how you deal with that yeah it's it's again part of the difficult balancing act i mean the the piece that probably is when i when it comes to it there's a lot of there's some pieces that are a little bit disheartening because the assumption is that we don't but the that the fact the matter is is that we do yes in different ways than they expect do we write everybody a check based on what the streaming was no right you know but do we make investments in racetracks? Do we make race investments in events? Do we make investments in our infrastructure? Do we do we create awareness in different ways? Things that we believe is long term investments in the growth of the sport. We started that from day one. Absolutely. So you know, as it relates to for, to the extent of even putting in lighting systems at racetracks to make sure the TV was right. So it's it's hard to you know you kind of balance that in. Is it a direct revenue share? I don't see that in our model. It's yeah. just not going to work because there's so many forward thinking investments that we have to make to continue this path. 
And for me, that's is na- that is navigating that world, balancing out okay the investment in world racing infrastructure, the ba- the investment in the fan experience, whether it be buying a video board for every single one of our racetracks when we haul them around the country. Yes. <laughs> Added investment, no additional uh, sanction fee. How do you create uh, how do you create the increased point fund, the increased prize money, the tow money, the support for the the support for the uh, owners through tow money and those pieces, those are the balancing act and it's getting it in and putting it in the right spot to make sure you get the right return on it, managing the long-term growth of the sport. And that's yeah. the hard part. So, you know, for me, it's the integration of the streaming, making sure that the fan at the track doesn't, I, when I started to hear some of the stuff in 2017 and 18, well, for you guys at home, here's the replay on Dirt Vision, and my fans are sitting there going, where's my replay? <laughs> so it's like that started to, now we're starting to encroach on what's the fan experience. I do not want to encourage anybody f- to stay at home. Right. So that, that became one of the things that, uh, I'm going to be honest with you, that disenchanted me with some of the coverage at the NASCAR races. As a gearhead, I wanted to see the telemetry and hear the crew chiefs talk and all the other pieces. Well, you know, I can see that on my TV a whole lot easier than I can see it sitting in the grandstands. Right. And that that was hard to do. So I just wanted to make sure I tried to avoid that and try to learn from all of our peers and figuring out how do we do this so that I can keep my race fans coming to the races. Yeah, good and, point. And for me, that was the real, when you start investing uh, seven digits on the video experience at the track for the fans who are already getting the visceral experience of the cars going by, it starts to it starts to become a real addition to the at track experience, and that's what I that's what we wanted to do and continue to do. But that balance of where it goes, the investment in the motorsports part of the Dirt Vision streaming piece, flipping that model on where TV doesn't cost us money, it's actually making us money. Yes. That happened day one, and and long term, I can expect it to continue to grow as. As we continue to grow awareness in, yeah. our, in our fan base, exactly, yeah. Finance and marketing. Your finance background. I'm just really curious. Um, I'm kind of, I'm a black and white operations, you know, kind of mindset. And and I look at the finances and how we do it. I'm, marketing is not my thing. How do you balance both of that with the finance piece and then? Because as the CEO, I mean, you kind of got to have a broad spectrum of everything. And where do you where do you feed on learning about all of those kinds of things? And well, it's for me is to know my limitations. So I know to know that I'm <laughs> know not a mar- I'm not a marketing guy. Don't ask me to look at a logo and pick between the two. I can tell you which uh, one I like better, but yeah, I can't tell you the yeah. why that shape is there to create the the different parts of a logo. How and, somebody and, sees it, you don't see it, it the same way as a creative it, person. Exactly, me neither. it's it's kind of black and white for me. Although I can you know as a CFO, you can make the number be whatever you want it to yeah. be right too sometimes. <laughs> but it's uh, but no, it's a challenge. It's understanding my uh, you know. Th- Introducing the financial discipline into the sport was something that had never really happened before. Uh, raising, um, you know, tens of millions of dollars and 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 allocating that. Uh, sometimes I was a little tighter on the purse strings than maybe I should have been investing in growth. So the hard part is balancing. My my dad promoted motorsports. He promoted rodeos. He promoted. It. So I I kind of was grew up as a promoter. Kind of see could see that. So I understood the balance of needing to be the show, but that usually costs money. And how do you balance that in? Are we getting our money? Uh, investment back so it's a it mainly knowing that i'm not a marketing guy i'm not a marketing guy i'm not a marketing guy i love promoting i love entertaining people but i'm not a marketing guy so i hired marketing i hire yeah. marketing people i put a marketing uh a marketing staff in place I, I have to trust them in doing what they're what they what they do and and that's the hard part as a ceo they do that better than i do and how many employees does world racing group have full-time employees right at 100 believe wow. it or not yeah we i think we paid uh, 275 or something like last week with, with contractors and part time, wow. and so it's it's a lot larger than people realize. It back to the expensive part. People see the see this, they hear about subscribers and streaming and all this stuff. They don't understand the infrastructure that it takes to run it, the connectivity that it takes. You know, at any particular point, we could have 10 or 12 um, broadcasts going on at the same time. So that takes one per at least plus the whole team to support the infrastructure so any particular point on a friday or saturday night we could have 25 people working not even at the racetrack so it's um it's 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 a tough piece you're managing people and money and money <laughs> it's your most important asset and your most Ab- biggest challenge at the same time absolutely it's yeah, one of the things that i was able to learn from mr hendrick from day one was just people 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 i mean you got to invest yep. in them and uh and and figure it out because otherwise our worlds don't go around, do they? <laughs> no, they don't. And you know, our, our sport's not really, and you know, it's hard to create a long term career path. Mm-hmm. Uh, people come in, they they're really good at what they're doing, but then creating a sustainable career path for them—that's part of our goal. And starting to figure out how do you how do you nurture the young, 
uh, uh, the enthusiasm, the high integrity people, how do you, how do you nurture them and keep them in motorsports and create a career path inside the business? And, you know, you come in as a competition director, do you, how do you become series director? How do you become, uh, an events court? You know, how do you move through the business? And yeah. that, that's uh, something that our, particularly the, the, all of the people want now you want to have a long-term path uh, yeah. for somebody and once you like i said it's an addiction too from a you, you do it because you love it um and that's i'm blessed to have a team that loves what they're doing yeah that's totally something here at the xfinity level that we deal with is you know people wanting to use this as a stepping stone obviously yeah. into cup and whether you're a driver or a crew chief or a pr person or whatever it is i, I usually don't have any problem keeping my operations people you know my human resources and accounting and IT and all that stays pretty much in place but when it comes to the competition piece of it um, you know they're they're looking for that growth and, yeah. and there's only so much growth that can happen here and um, you know it's that's another um, uh, issue with sponsorship kind of in the same light right because you have sponsors that are attached to drivers who move up and then that moves on so it's kind of a constant uh, thing that we battle here is that change and evolution of people and and how do we how do we make them want to be lifers in the xfinity series right 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 <laughs> if no. that's possible yeah, do the best you can that's yeah. all you can do yeah uh, just try to keep it where people are challenged and feel the success yeah i wanted to talk about um just kind of uh, the perception of, you know, what do you think the perception is of the World of Outlaw series? And when you say the word outlaw, obviously it has all these connotations, right? And, um, you know, just what does that marketing look like for you guys um, in the series and, and the perception that you want people to see? Yeah, I want to see them as the, I want people to see us as the pinnacle of, of dirt racing. I want to see, you know, I want them to know what they're going to get when they come to the racetrack. They're going to see the best accumulation of drivers in an environment that's visceral and they feel it. And they, and you know, the sprint cars are awesome, but the world of outlaws racing, the program, the entertainment value, the part of the the community really the outlaws the world of outlaws is is really just the name of the community we have some badass racing there's no doubt about that that it's just uh out amazing what these guys can do in the car and not only in the sprint cars but on the late models but what it what we want which is why we've always had open pit area always i want the people to feel connected to it for some reason, you know, I want them to feel whatever it is. It's a personal attachment to the racetrack. You can get people to come out, but until when they're connected personally, it becomes a part of their lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And that's what we're after with the World of Outlaws. Is how do you create it to where they feel like they're part of something special? They can escape from whatever they're going to escape from. Uh, for that moment in time, they come into the racetrack or watching it on TV and just enjoying themselves watching some really amazing entertainment. And if we can do that, that, that's my goal for the World of Outlaws is to become – and then to become as aware as possible. I don't have to change a thing. We're not going to the next level. We're not doing any of this other stuff. We are going to just make people aware of what we're doing and invite them in. And my goal is to see if we can do that as, to as many people as possible and entertain them along the way. Have you um, experienced with the World Racing Group and, and your series um, the influx of younger racers and, and balancing that against – the star power of the Steve Kinsers of the world and, you know, the people that have come before them that, you know, we talk about this in, in NASCAR, you know, uh, my dad in particular didn't start racing until he was 28, you know, and, and, and took his first laps in a, in a stock car in the cup series. And now I'm raising a 12 year old racer, you know, so uh -huh. I, I, I battle this with myself, um, you know, on what that looks like, but what's that experience like um, in the world of outlaw series and the dirt cars and, and, um, how is it changing and how are you well everybody being wants okay to, with that <laughs> well, everybody wants to live this accelerated lifestyle right yeah. so that so they would now 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 yeah. like on the world of outlaws side i mean i was there for kyle larson's first win at chico and he was six i mean we don't let them race until they're 16. i have to have this conversation once a year with an uh, with somebody ambitious dad that's <laughs> my son's the next best thing guys listen 16 mm, it's 16 yeah. these cars are there's no These. reason. There's plenty of races you can go race someplace else. When they show up, they're gonna when they they're this amazing person. They're gonna win when they're, they're 16 still gonna in be a amazing, day. Right? They're still gonna be amazing. <laughs> so the hard part is balancing that accelerated lifestyle to the expectations, and everybody's on on the chip. Especially at the, a lot of people are gonna be on the chip at the racetrack. So, but it's just balanced. Like 
stick to our guns. It's 16 on the World of Outlaws. We've got plenty of other places for you to go racing, uh, managing those pieces. But, it, you know, it's hard. You're not going to slow anybody down. Uh, you just can. You just have to stick to what's best for the business there yeah. and what's best for the sport. Because the last thing I need is to be talking to somebody about somebody uh, doing something getting hurt yeah. or, you know, the, the risk is still very high and mitigating risk in this business will be the thing that's, I mean, that is the highest. Number one thing on your radar. It is. Yeah. We, mitigating yeah. the risk is the one thing that's the single point of failure yeah. for us. And we just got to keep managing that. And, and we have a great relationship with our, with our insurance companies and all the rest, but, you know, managing those expectations and giving them a place to race, whether it be in the micros or the midgets or other places where they can race in their youth. We enjoy, we, we want to see that. I grew up Again, as a fan at the racetrack when I was four, I want there to be a, those lifestyles created around it, and, and people do crazy things for the kids. Right? Yeah. So I've, <laughs> do, I've been there, done that. So uh, I just want them to know that that we're consistent and professional on that front, and just be patient. Patience yeah. here will help. Yeah. And how do you see? Uh, you know, what what do you feel like builds um, these drivers? You know persona and charisma and personality that are coming into the sport well you just named it that's the they have to be connected people want to be like them that our, all when you look at all the people that were our there was this allure of what they were doing that you wanted to get to know them you wanted to be like them those sorts of pieces so it really becomes how how good a person you are can you be the kind heart can you be that amazing race car driver do you want to be somebody that you people want to be around in the pit area around your t and that's really just building that community those are the people that'll be successful some of the best best guys and gals in the sport are there because of their relationships and what they what they were like not how they performed on the racetrack mm -hmm. and that's 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 what you know you've got to continue to perpetuate that you know people can only go so far being that great a race car driver and if you're not a good people person, can't create the relationships, the long-term sponsor connections, the long-term fan connections, then you're going to be short-lived in this sport. It'll eat you up and spit you right back out. Yeah, I think about it like, you know, and I, I've heard this all my life with my dad. He's just like me. You know, I feel like I can sit down and have a beer with him or, or, or sit at the dinner table. But he has a superpower, right? Yeah. He could like see the air at Daytona or whatever it was, right? And I think that's that that is how people want to see these guys. They want to see them just like me. I have that connection. They're just like me. But man, they have the superpower mm -hmm. to take this beast around the racetrack at these exhilarating right. speeds right. and do things, you know, race side by side. And, yeah, no, and that's create that, so. still death defying, right? Yeah. We want that to right. be that case. And yeah. what they do is extraordinary. But, you know, they, we want people to, to see them as they're available. Yeah. yeah they're yeah. available yeah. and you can connect with them. Yeah, exactly. All right. So, um, want to talk about competitive series and, uh, the, the introduction, obviously high limits last year and the introduction of, um, uh, their new program and, and talk about the world racing group and the world of outlaws, um, you know, payouts and programs and how it all works for the audience. Um, even for myself, I'm not super familiar with it, but I want to talk about that and, and how that has, how, how you've, how you're managing that and working through that and what that looks like for you guys. Yeah, no, it's, uh, you know, my job has been to create opportunity for everybody, right? So we create opportunity. So uh, I can only fill so many weekends with the World of Outlaws schedules. And if there's desire for more, they're going to, that this opportunity has come up. And that's, you know, I, I take pride in the ability to grow the sport. And everything I do is still going to continue to be about growing the sport. So, you know, it um, the competition is there and it has always been there. We're always competing with somebody. Yeah. So whether it be High Limit this year, the All-Stars, the ASCS, or Kennedy soccer and baseball <laughs> and all the other entertainment value that we have. So we've been competing our entire lives. So competition is not new. And uh, direct competition just makes you hone your decision-making skills. So it's, um, you know, I, I'm taking... I'm very proud of creating opportunity for 20 years. I believe sprint car racing is in a better spot than it was um, over in the past. So for that, I'm, I'm very proud of that. And, and creating opportunity, you know, it, our business model is based on how we got here and the evolution of where I think it's going to be. And I'm, I'm going to stick to that and we're going to be true to what we are going to be. We're going to stay, stay the course on entertaining race fans, bringing people out, creating the community, being true to what the world of outlaws is creating a roster of drivers. that's unmatched in the sport. And then an entertainment value. When you come to the racetrack, you know what you're getting. So we're going to stick to that. Um, you know, the payouts and all that, I've been evolving over time. I mean, we, when you look at the point funds, we, we still stick to the same thing. We've, we, we, we reward drivers for a great over year, 
a, an annual performance. We have big praying prize money. We, we want to be a part of the biggest shows in the country. And uh, we want to figure out an, an, a way to reward the teams for that commitment to us in a way that matches what they need for us to. So uh, for us, it's it's trying to stick to our, you know, not getting too distracted with the competition because we've been competing our entire, yeah. every business is competing. Yeah. You guys, whether it be in a car down the street, you know, the two cars are going faster. You see who's faster. Absolutely. It's really about sticking to what our commitment is to the race fans and to our team and, and then, and then excelling. I, I can't, you know, pursuing excellence. And if yeah. we do that, then we'll, whatever part of the world we get, I'll be real happy with. <laughs> but, it, you know, the the people ask me, well, you know, you're doing this because of that. Well, no, that's been in the process for a long time. Yeah. You know, we've we've been increasing our point funds. You know, we're paying triple what we paid five years ago for our incentives to the teams and uh, different pieces of that. Yes, they're aware of it because we have somebody to compare us to. And, uh, <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm, I'm okay with that. More has come out of the bag, right? Because um, you learn more because now there's some else to talk about right that's right so, and, yeah, and you yeah. have to you're allocating resources yeah. as you know I've, I've always been very consistent with i'm going to i'm going to strengthen the world racing group i'm going to strengthen the racetracks i'm going to strengthen the teams i'm going to strengthen the the delivery to the race fans and some version of that's going to get a priority every year you can't everybody can't be top priority or you start spreading yourself too thin so just continuing to make those investments so that we are on a long-term path to make sure we can continue to do this and that's my goal well, and it says something when Brad Sweet shows up to your first event, right? I know he won your first event, but when they're still coming and participating, there's something to it, right? Yeah. No, that's right. No, yeah. I, 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 I've, I've been very clear on my message. I don't care what color the car is once it comes in the racetrack. I, yeah. I, we're, we want everybody to come. We want everybody to have a great time. We want yeah. it's, we're not going to, there's no bias. It's, it's fair. But the guys that stick with us and are committed to us long term are yeah. going to be rewarded for that. Yeah. And nothing and wrong with that. Right? Nothing wrong with that. Yeah. That's what they agree to and what yeah. we agree to. And my goal is to continue to make sure I can make that number grow for everybody. Yeah. And that's the same. I mean, in our sport, you know, you have, you sign up to run points in a particular series and you have you're on the owner's plan if you run with a full-time driver etc cetera, etc cetera. so there's lots of similarities there that that make that i mean and that makes our investment worth it from the competitor side right, right. that you have that kind of system in place because you know we from, from my standpoint in nascar i need the longevity and the stability to be there for me to make the investment year over year over year that's, so that's that right. You works for your competitors. Um, what about? I want to know uh, your your thoughts on charters. You know, it's such a big topic in NASCAR with the Cup charters. Obviously, High Limits has talked about charters. Um, you know, what what are some thoughts there? Um, I do, I don't see them being successful in our world. Yeah. Um, when you look at what we're trying to do, I'm not managing 40 teams for 40 spots to start. We've got 24 spots and we've got 400 competitors across the country. So what I need to do is make sure that we're compensating people fairly, we're creating rewards and incentives, and we're creating prize money and events that continue to grow. So again, the the, the money comes inbound. It's pretty simple. It was Historically, it was fans and sponsorship for us. We didn't, TV was a minus number. Yeah, there was no qu right. question that TV was always a negative number for a World Racing Group and World of Outlaws. Now it's a positive number. It's creating those inflows and, and creating a growth plan for for everybody involved you know i don't know what the right number is i've you know i've never seen the charter agreement that high limits are proposing i know that the charter agreement is causing a lot of an animosity right now in the nascar world yeah. so i'm not you know but we're managing 400 competitors we're traveling across the country we're only bringing 12 to 13 14 17 on the late model we're bringing a certain number of, of full-time teams you know to the point where we only travel in and there's only 40 cars i'm really going to be uh, that that's not that's our concerning. business that's yeah. not our business model and yeah so creating the balancing act of how everybody's compensated including the local and the regional super regional teams that's an important part to me in getting that managed in and right now it seems to be working so right now i don't see any any place for that in our business uh yeah. I'm, nobody's tried it it may, hopefully we all learn something from it you know well, nascar's tried it for seven years and they're running into hiccups too so <laughs> yeah no and then they, you know they, they, there's obviously always a chance to learn yeah right <laughs> uh, but you know for us you know i'm not i don't see it right now in our future yeah. I, I can totally see that i'm thinking about um you know i i reached out to a lot of our cars competitors and just talked about as we were moving into this year talking about our purse structure and we really don't have a year-end points fund and things like that and just really thinking i said what's important to you and they're like it's important to me that i can show up to the events 
that I'm able to show up to based off of whatever, um, you know, financial backing they have or whatnot. So um, the the long term year end isn't as attractive because, like you said, it ultimately ends up with there's in our in, in our series in particular, there's you know, maybe there's 11 to 15 that can do that all year yeah. long. But like you said, there's 60 to 80 competitors that can come out to an event. Right. And so then how do you, you know, make that event the best that it can be? Um, and uh, so, yeah, I'm, I'm you know, I, I'm. I don't know how that would work, um, the charter situation. I know that, you know, particularly in NASCAR, um, it, it's created a barrier of entry, quite frankly. Um, yeah. And now, has it been some more lucrative for them to have some guaranteed numbers on the mm-hmm. team side? And oh, great, yes, absolutely. But it has become somewhat of a barrier of entry to, um, you know, what you can do and how you can participate and what you, I mean, for somebody like us who's been in the sport this long and then wanting to maybe dive into cup racing, you know, it's a, it's a, right. it's a big decision. These days. Well, I don't, I don't know what the numbers <laughs> look like anyway. So if you're consolidating it into yeah. five or 10 teams, yeah. how much it gets into uh, that consolidation of exactly. wealth concerns me a lot. Yeah. So how does that, how does that happen? And, and, you know, I, again, I need to have to make the economics work for everybody, do the best I can at it anyway. I don't know what that number is. I don't know how, how much should be allocated to those teams or not. And then you, if you create this, like you said, a barrier to entry or consolidation of wealth yeah. in the sport, that is not what the world of Alice is going to be about. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very true. All right. So you've raced some yourself. Tell me about that. You still dabble in a little racing. Yeah. No, I've never been a very good race car driver. <laughs> you know, I, I enjoy it. I have, enjoy good it. T- I have a good yeah. time. That's right. Yeah. So, what do you race? What, what kind so of stuff do you enjoy? I, well, I still have a sprint car. I've won as a, as, as a car owner. I'm enjoying that a lot now, too. So I've been uh, one locally here with Jake McLean. I've done some stuff there. But I my I race a little stock car. Uh, I have a pro stock in the Northeast, which should become the national dirt car stock car class but i've not really been successful doing that yet but i have a great time racing with the guys you know again it's it it was just trying to broaden my perspective as a decision maker i enjoyed racing i I raced some before i started with world racing group just an old imca stock car around dallas and i just enjoy it just i'm more of a tinker gearhead guy and and i like i end up having to fix my race cars a lot (laughs) so (laughs) so it was one of those things it was it was a good time for me and and that and over the course of um my career, I've had a chance to play in a sprint car and a midget at the Chili Bowl and and the a dirt late model at Volusia and see how fast they get really going around that place. And so it's just again, it's it's it was fun for me. It's still fun for me. And, and as long as it's fun for me, I'm going to have some version of a race car for me to go out and play. You know, it's hard for when I go to the racetrack, I want to play and the people come up to me and I'm now I'm working. It's like <laughs> so it's a difficult, but um, I just enjoy being part of the group and. And it, it does broaden my perspective to help me understand, okay, it's expensive to go buy race tires. It's yeah. expensive to go, well, that body panel, is it plastic? Should it be aluminum? Is it should this? It's like, you know, like when I get my money out and pay for it, uh, you know, buying pit passes and all those pieces, it's, it, it helps me understand the whole system. And um, I'm blessed to be able to do it because most of the time I'm doing it, it's because my team has got the event under control and I don't have to really work there. So, <laughs> but, uh, but it's, again, it's just as a, as a car guy, I just enjoy it. And I, I love the community. I love who I race with, uh, with the pro stock series up in the Northeast. And I just, uh, I like being able to, to just jump in the car and put the helmet on and everything just, else goes away. Yeah. Everything it's else goes away. A lot of, um, it's fun and like stress relief, kind of like just, yeah. you know, be in a different world, right? Not your everyday business world. So I know there's lots of great world, um, world of outlaw events, dirt car events. What's what, give me, give me some top five events that if you're a fan and you haven't been out to see uh, your series run, where, where should they come? Wow. Five out of, I don't know. Out of 250. I that's know. Be, well, that's I mean, a, you no, know, no, I know, like, I, give I me like, the top event yeah, from yeah. each division. Yeah, there you know. go. No, that's know. even yeah. harder. Oh my <laughs> no, gosh. See? Just so, give me some top events. No, you're <laughs> go no that's it's 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 great uh i have so many to choose from it's yeah. it's amazing i really enjoy i mean there's nothing about the community at the knoxville nationals yes. the campground at eldora the the pit area at peevely or at, at a at prairie dirt classic uh the just the the whole environment of pressing this the speedway to the limits at volusia you know it's really about the community people where we're gathering all these people that it becomes a family reunion for them you know it's uh it's something about uh, seeing the scenery, I miss Calistoga with the ba- mountains in the background. There's just so many things to, you know, pick one and come out and take a look. That's what, that's my goal for the race fans. Pick one, come and take a look. Uh, the history of the, la- you know, the first and the last race at, at Devil's Bowl were meaningful. Um, 
it's just there's so many different things. I still can see the grandstands full at Syracuse the <laughs> last year. What we're trying to do now with uh, we're doing Oswego, uh, the Hell Tour in and of itself isn't one event. It's a whole this this month of of craziness, and these guys are are it's amazing to watch them. There's so many different aspects. It's pick something and come out and take a look at it. Yeah. And um, for me, the best racing is still at Peavley with uh, at Kenny Schrader's track. I've never been to Peavely. One it of is the ones I haven't been to. A mini Eldora. For me, that just <laughs> that you can see, it's you know running 55 laps in less than 10 minutes, and I see Sheldon lap up to fourth, and no green, no no yellow flags, and it's just insanity. Um, it's just so many different moments in time. Uh, and there, I don't know where the next one's going to come from. And that's the beauty of it. I don't know. Yeah. We're going back to Volusia this week. We're going to be at all these amazing new racetracks. We're going to be at all these amazing historical tracks. What are some of the new tracks that are on the series this year? Oh, don't start me lying. We've got so many. Um, I mean, mostly for, for us, the the hole in my heart with losing Devil's Bowl. We're at Kennedale, which is where I, I grew up racing my stock car a little bit and, te- and just down, just south of downtown Fort Worth, Kennedale Speedway. That's going to be a good one. We're going to we're going to be hanging from the rafters there. <laughs> Big O Speedway. Um, it's there's so many with the late model series. I can't even start to list them. It's 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 the beauty of it. We can we can move our series around. Yeah. We can uh, adapt them to the speedways. We can adapt, but the the staples still stand there. You know, there's nothing. They're going fast at Houston. It's it's just there's so many yeah. different places. Um, you know. Friends at Beaver Dam. I miss the old clubhouse at Beaver Dam. It had a, uh, but it was just so many different things about it. Um, so yeah, yeah. I'm overwhelmed kind of think about it actually. Yeah, so. I've I've learned a lot with Wyatt racing, uh, dirt racing, and uh, on the dirt, and and you know he he watches nonstop YouTube and everything under the sun, and and I didn't even know he knew so much about the late model drivers, and I've just uh, for Christmas he wanted uh, some of the late model guys die cast and this that and the other and you know he's telling me names and you know i mean if you obviously brandon shepherd and there's some that you've you know jonathan davenport there's people that you've heard of and then um you know he's like my favorite driver is oh gosh i don't even know it's tyler somebody maybe is there a tyler there's a tyler, <laughs> tyler. Uh, might be tyler i don't know but he's i mean he just he, he's it's just so fun to uh, listen and and like you said there there is a lot going on that's the one thing that and particularly Again, you know, my background in NASCAR, hearing all about, you know, is NASCAR what it used to be? Do you have the same fan bases? What are the TV ratings doing? Da, 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 da. Everybody wants to debate all this stuff. There is so much racing going on in the United States of America, yep. everywhere you look. When I get on my race pass or when I get on race monitor to, to, to look for my son's event on what I'm doing, I am amazed at you know, 40 to 50 events every weekend somewhere. A race fan can catch something somewhere every single weekend of the year. Every single weekend. Every single and weekend of the year. Most of the time, four or five nights a week. Absolutely. There's something going yeah. on. That's that's yeah. the beauty of it. Most it's alive and well. I know that we fight a bunch of challenges. And like you said, just keeping keeping the whole ecosystem healthy and, and all. But uh, it, it's it's alive and well. And it's alive and well because of people like you. Well, it's it's alive and well because of the community we built and the, the community that continues to grow. Like you said, the race fans evolve, the sports evolving, the entertainment's evolving, our communication is evolving, everything is evolving. So how do, how do we position it so for the best chance of success going forward? That's right. And how do we, everybody bring a friend. That's my, <laughs> that's my theory this week. Every year, this is my theory this year. If you go into the racetrack, bring a friend. Bring a friend. Show them something new. Introduce it to somebody. Introduce it to somebody and then right. give them a chance to, to see it. And yeah. then we'll keep the ones we can and then we'll keep doing the best to keep as many as we can. So it's that's that's my ask for all the race fans. Bring a friend. Bring right. a friend to the racetrack and then we'll we'll spread that you'll, resource You'll out. do the rest, right? We'll do the rest. Bring a friend, <laughs> we'll entertain them and we'll introduce you to all of our friends and you can just see how crazy we really are. <laughs> all right, last question. What legacy do you want to leave uh, at World Racing Group? Wow. Uh, I want it to be better than it was when I got here. That's what I want it to be. I want I want it to put it in a position that it, that the foreseeable future there's a success path for people, really just to, enter, to entertain people. That I wanted people to see that we really did try, and we really did make progress against a really tough time to evolve the sport. the 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 early two thousands, the 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 late two thousands, through the dynamics of 
bring in sport parts of the sport. When we when we bought the World of Outlaws, there were four full time drivers and seven employees. We bought wow. uh, for the the business from Bob Memmer had passed away and it was really lost. And when we bought the business from Glenn Donnelly, it, they you know it was just in a different place. So my goal is to make sure that I've positioned it when I'm done in a spot for success in the future. And that's my that's my what I want to leave behind. So, it's it's a challenge. Um, it's a dynamic I never kind of expected my career to get to. But for me, it's about leaving the legacy that I've 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 left it in a spot that was better than I found it, and I've positioned it as best I can for the future. Excellent. Well, this has been really interesting. I've um, learned and grown a lot, and uh, can tell you're the right man for the job. You're going to leave a great legacy. I can tell for World Racing Group. So, thank you so much for coming on with me, Brian. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right. Well, that's it for this edition of Business and Motorsports. Um, hope you enjoyed it, and we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Mm-hmm.